welcome to the Spent the Rent podcast. I am your host, Patty Rose. I have two guests today, two of the newest members of the Springfield City Council, Corey Rodley and Damian Pitts. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So this is really cool. I've had you both on the show. I think I was officially, Damian, you're, I hope I can call you by your first names. Uh, it's going to be so much easier. Uh, I had you, I was the first formal interview, I believe, for your, when you were appointed uh, back on my birthday, you actually were officially appointed March 8th, 2021, after replacing now Mayor Sean Van Gordon. Uh, That was a tough time, if you remember, and you were awesome, because my brother had just passed away unexpectedly, and you were great, and and you're like, are you sure you want to do this? And I'm like, I do want to do this, (laughs) because it gives me something to kind of keep my brain busy, and gives me confidence, and so... I appreciate your kindness that day. It was really cool. And then Corey, I had you on when you were running uh, back in 2020. And what what a wild uh, crew that you ran against. Some of Springfield's, you know, busiest people, Johannes Tadeo and uh, uh, Chris. Chris McAllister. Chris McAllister. Oh, my gosh. He's he's constantly busy in our community doing great things. So that was it, obviously that must have meant a lot to you to know that you ran against such qualified people. And and uh, yeah, that was a tough one to choose. So I'm going to read a description from the website from the city website on what it is that the mayor and the city council do. I think I think I wish I wish I would have done this when I talked to you guys the first time. So I just I think it's really thorough and it kind of gets it across for the people that are listening that may not be aware what's of, of what city council does. So it says the mayor and city council make up the legislative branch of the Springfield city government. Each of the six members of the city council are elected by citywide vote and represent an area of town called the ward. The mayor is also elected by citywide vote. The mayor and city council members serve without pay as volunteers for four year terms. They set city policy and make decisions regarding ordinances and resolutions, authorizing contracts, setting city goals and adopting the city's annual budget. The mayor and city council also appoint the city manager, city attorney, municipal court judges, and many residents to serve on advisory committees. The mayor and city council guide the city staff to provide high-quality, cost-effective services to the residents of Springfield. Funny side note, that part where it talks about uh, budgets, I had Googled stuff trying to figure out what to ask you guys about, and I came across something, and I'm like, oh, looks like Springfield's got a surplus. And then I sent you guys my notes, and then I did a little more research and that's not this Springfield. That's the fun thing about, it's really difficult to find information about specifically Springfield, Oregon. So it's very small and there's a, you know, a million Springfields in or in America. So, so the reason I had you on today is I wanted to talk about now that you are the two newest members, uh, on the, on the council. And I wanted to talk about some of your early days and what you learned, you know, right off the bat, Corey, you've been on a little longer. So let's start with you. Uh, tell me your thoughts on your early time in office. Oh, um, well, I think um, because I came on at, I mean, it was, like you said, the, the campaign was wild in that, um, you know, it was a, it was an open seat and it was contested and we were all progressive um, of varying levels of progression. <laughs> um, and so I think it was such an, it was such an interesting campaign and And I was so motivated the whole time to try to just keep things really elevated because my, I I mean, I thought that that race reflected the Springfield that I want to live in, where you've got these sort of really um, passionate, diverse folks who were like focused on wanting to be involved. And so um, I didn't want it to feel like icky politics. I wanted it to feel like we just were kind of elevating each other's work. So, um, and coming out of that, coming into the council was, we didn't have a mayor. There was still a lot of like tension around what that process was even gonna look like. So I was just like, just determined to sort of find where I fit and then move forward. So. But it felt a little, it felt weird. I mean, it really didn't start to feel solid until Damien got there and we got through the, the mayor piece. And um, then we're like, okay, we're all here. We're all kind of getting to know who we are. Um, and then it started to like figure out who we were. But it never felt quite what I expected because we were remote. Like in my vision, you know, we were going to all come together and there was going to be like the swearing in and we're going to do things. The fact that we were remote made it just also feel a little bit weird. Yeah. You know, in in the election, it was interesting because it was it was a kind election. At least there was not a lot of mudslinging. 
I don't know if that happens too much. It can, you know, and it, and, but the three of you were so respectful and, and supportive of each other that there was no way Springfield could have gone wrong. You know, uh, Damien, when you came on, yours was a little different. You were appointed, uh, after the mayor, Sean Van Gordon, uh, was appointed to mayor from this council. So your situation, you were thrust into it kind of at an off time doing this all alone. Uh, what were your early takeaways from the, from the early days in office? Um, <clears throat> I mean, kind of like Corey said, you know, it's kind of hard when you're on zoom cause you can't really interact and you, you can't notice body movements. And, and, and another thing at the time of the meetings and the meetings sometimes would almost go to 10 o'clock, you know, I eat dinner at six o'clock. And so, you know, there were hangry moments to where I just was like, can we speed this up? But then I realized it's like, you know, okay, I need to figure out ways to um, stay focused and, you know, but I was going into work every day. And so, you know, I would have to try to leave a little bit early to get here and set up and, and all that stuff. And, and it, it was, it was kind of taxing, but then also there were other meetings. It's like, okay, why do I have so many meetings? And, you know, and I do a lot of different things outside of this. And so, you know, there it was a struggle to really, really find balance and, and sometimes even purpose. Yeah. And, and I mean, people just don't realize I'm going to drill this home. These are unpaid positions. I mean, this is, people always think that it's like, you know, oh, they're just doing this for money. No, no, no. I don't understand how, the little work that I've done as a precinct committee person for the democratic party of Lane County and the zoom meetings that I do, I prefer the zoom meetings because, uh, it gives me a chance to, like you were saying, if you want to eat, I just put my camera off and eat a burrito, you know, but while you're doing the meeting and you can pay attention, but I'm also not in a position where my decisions are going to have that much of an impact. I'm just kind of part of the bigger, bigger picture, but how do you juggle all of the meetings and work life? Do you have, I mean, like tools, is there any, like do you, your calendar, your iPhone calendar has to be, has to be chock full. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> I like I like to do when you're talking about it. It's like, I mean, I knew going in that it was unpaid, but I, I don't think you really think about it. Cause like Damien, like I've served on boards and I've served on, you know, task forces and things like that. Um, and then once you get in and you like get your committee assignments and you're like, oh, like yeah, it's a lot. Um, and I like to joke that the city of Springfield gets about four thousand dollars worth of labor out of me every month, you know, because of just how much, you know, and I call it my like 20 hour a week on my part time job. But um, so for me, I also have a day job at United Way and my day job is pretty, it takes up a lot too. So I live by calendar, like my Outlook calendar. Um, and I just put everything into one calendar. So I try to keep myself organized. I also sometimes have to prioritize and that has not always, I mean, that's gotten me into a little, some little bumps because there are some committees that are like overlapped with other things. Um, that are, that are going on. And I've had to be like, I can't come to this committee meeting because I have to be at this board meeting for my work or things like that. So I think the fact that I, we now, I want to say, um, well, at least I'm a, if you include the mayor, the majority of us have day jobs now. Um, Councillor Stair does, Councillor Pitts does, I do, the mayor does. And so that's interesting. I've also had to try to like swap some committees because I'm trying to create some balance between day meetings and night meetings. And I, I understand the equity and stuff around that because I, I, I just, you know, the ones with a lot of community volunteers need to meet at night, but that also means the staff is like, you know, working all day and into the night. And so the staff wants to have some day meetings, but for me, some, and so there's some day meetings I can make that are easier than night meetings. So it sounds really messy because it is. Oh yeah, I <laughs> would imagine. I'm still juggling some of it and saying, can somebody trade me for this meeting? Because it's just, it's too many night meetings or too many day meetings. Or But you do prefer... I'll start with you, Corey. You do prefer the in-person meetings for city council? I really prefer the in-person meetings for city council. Um, I, I think it just, it feels more collaborative. Um, and it just, it, it feels, 
I just prefer being in person anyway, even though having the Zoom has made it possible for us to do more. Sure. <laughs> so that's part of it. Like now it's like, let's cram in 17 meetings a day where we could have with travel time, we would have only had to do four. But um, I think and there's accessibility. It's it's been so fantastic how many people are paying attention. Like yeah. I, I used to go to work session meetings as just a person prior to being on council and nobody would go to those. And now we will get like, you know, 30, 40, 50 people, depending on the topic, paying attention to a work session. So that's really great. Um, but just the like collaborative work with my, my peers, I prefer to do in person. What about you, Damien? Do you prefer being in person or are you a Zoom? Um, fan? It depends on the type of meeting, you know, um, one thing about, I mean, we've only had one city council meeting in person and that was two weeks ago and it was fine. I mean, I, I, and luckily it was a short meeting, but you know, when I think about some of the meetings that go to nine, nine 30 or the various meetings that are stacked, like, and then if you think about it, we still can't, I, I, I hate to keep bringing up food, <laughs> but you know, it is a basic need and, you know, for various reasons, we can't have food uh, in the chamber or whatever, which means that, and, and, and I get off of work at five, you know, so I pretty much say bye to my coworkers, get in my car, drive to city hall park. And then, you know, I'm just in meetings. And so I'm glad, you know, I'm glad that they're in person. I prefer face-to-face contact for most times. Uh, but you know, other meetings, I just, I just don't go to, you know, if, if there's something eight to five, I'm not going, uh, unless it's, unless I know about it way ahead of time. Uh, but I'm not leaving work to go to anything that's Springfield related. I just don't have that bandwidth. And I really, you know, work in a high intensity office and I'm not going to leave them for a ribbon cutting, you know? And so I'm not your typical city count. I don't like taking pictures, you know? Uh, So yeah, I mean, some meetings in person, yes, because you can build genuine relationships. You know, one thing I've learned is that a lot of people are real tough on phone and on Zoom, but they soft as doctors cotton (laughs) uh, in person. And so I'm looking forward to seeing how some of those people who were virtually in my face are going to react when they actually have to say it to my face. Yeah. Uh, and, and this isn't me being, you know, threatening or whatever, but you know, a lot of people are real bold when they don't have to be in front of that person. And so I, I do welcome to see what other people's reactions are going to be when they actually have to say it to my face. Well, and you'll see when you see me in person, I'm only five one. No, we've we've met in person. <laughs> we, it, it, it's funny. So uh, it is funny though, because you know Thomas Yuda, good friend of mine. I had talked to him. We were we became really really close virtually before, mm-hmm. and it's I I'm not from an era, and I don't think either of you are either. I think we're all around the same age, you know, roughly. I mean, give or take twenty, but like uh, no, I don't know. But <laughs> but uh, uh, you know. I didn't, I'm not, I'm not used to that meeting people online. Yeah. You have some friends that you've met that you play games with from a different state or something like that, but not someone that you really bond with. And then I met him and he's like six inches taller than me and I hated it. (laughs) So, so, uh, uh, you two seem to be like, you have built a really strong friendship. Uh, You know, I'm kind of seeing this from the outside. I'll start with you, Damien. And then I want to get your take on it too, Corey. Did you know each other before? Or... Yes, uh, she and I both came onto the Equity and Access Board at the same time, and, and, and we're very different, but I think in a lot of ways we fed off each other. We respectfully disagreed, and I think if we disagreed on stuff, we learned from it, and, 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 and we were able to use our own identities to paint a different picture, and then when you put those two pictures together, you get a great product, and so it was definitely very, very beneficial. I, I think <laughs> I remember a meeting where I just kind of, I didn't go off, but I just wasn't having it. And Corey said, well, if Damien can say that, I can too. And I just busted out laughing. It just made everything better. And so there was definitely a feeding off of each other that, that uh, created a unique relationship. What about you, Corey? Yeah, let's hear your take on it. Yes. Um, 
I also, I think Damien captured it really well in that um, we often don't agree, but it, it brings such a breadth to um, a particularly when you're talking about like diversity and equity and you know people particularly you know here in the the west coast and and white folks um we tend to look at it really narrow right it's either about race or that you know so it's like to really understand <laughs> sure. the depth of it or to understand that um you know all people of color don't think this way Right. right. Or all people of this age don't think this way. And so I've really appreciated that because like Damien said, it's very respectful. And it's also felt sometimes really kind of exploratory and just just really honest to say. And I'm, I think of a, in, when we were um, hadn't worked together very long and learning, um, you know, that Damien is an Eagle Scout and came up in scouting me being a lesbian and being part of the LGBTQ community have very different feelings about Boy Scouts. And we were able to like kind of hear each other and feel each other around that to just be like, yeah, I mean, I could see from a, from a person of, from, from a kiddo of color who's coming up in this experience, what that, how positive that would be. And here's how that feels from my perspective. And all of that together is like that's diversity right that's yeah. like making space for all of that and being able to be in the world together so i appreciate and plus he's smart and i just really like smart people yeah. and people with a sense of humor so that you're able to just like dig into things and not personalize so i i have just i i enjoy working with him i could see and this is probably reading too much into it but i can see that there's like a lot of trust and security safety you know how when you have friends that you care about that they're the reason that you want their company is because it makes you feel safe, you know, where you just, you feel like I have that person I can lean on. And from the little bit that I've seen you two on your time on the council, that you, you kind of have that for each other. And that's, that's really important. I mean, that's the whole, what I've learned by doing this show is that that's what the council is all about is that you get people that aren't going to agree, but are going to have perspective and then bring that to the table. And then when you have someone that you can relate to or, or respect, and or respect that makes a huge difference i'm sure so that's cool i mean and and you know damien talking to you when i when i had you on it's so funny that people's you know because people think this these are nonpartisan seats and people think that oh well you know be, and 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 probably the same for you too Corey. it's like oh because you're this that means that you think this and that couldn't be farther from the truth you know i mean it's like there's a lot of gay people too that are conservative you know <laughs> you know what i mean and uh, I segued that weird, Damien. I don't think you're gay. Uh, so, <laughs> man, who knows? <laughs> not uh, yeah, no, no. But uh, yeah, just just for the listener, you know. And I think that it's interesting. I don't know if this to me matters tremendously too much. But are you aware if you are each the first in your demographic? Like, are you the first African American Damien to be appointed or to be on the city council in Springfield? Second. Second. So the first was Jesse Maine, and this was in the '90s. Uh, you know, there's a park named after him. And then one of the meeting rooms in City Hall is named after him. But to be honest, if you do a search, you, you can't find much. You know, when I was appointed, uh, you know, I'd heard about his wife and I heard that maybe she was still in the area. And so, you know, my culture, the first thing that I do is go meet her, thank her and, you know, say thank you for setting, you know, the stage for me to even do this. But there's nothing. Uh, uh, Counselor Mo sent me an article that was written a while ago where I guess Jesse Mayne was, you know, one of the top 100 springs, something like that. But other than that, you really cannot find anything. And, and, and it just it blows my mind. So, yeah. So, I mean, I'm the second. Yeah. And then for you, Corey, I mean, like you said, being a lesbian, are you aware if you're the first uh, LGBT I, person? I refer to myself as being the first out. <laughs> Sure. LGBTQ person on the council because I just assume that there have been people before me but who were not necessarily out um just based on reality so I think I'm the first out one I was definitely like you know running um I think you and I talked about it when I was campaigning because you, you don't know what the campaign is going to look like and I was nervous about it and my spouse was nervous about it but then just the way the campaign 
<laughs> went and the optics of the campaign, I definitely just looked like because I'm older or whatever or sure. whatever. I looked like the more conservative person in it. And so the fact that I was a lesbian, I I mean, maybe it came up. I don't know. My my spouse Terry likes to joke when people ask about it. She's like, Oh, the Republicans elected Corey to the city council <laughs> because of just the way the race was. But I don't know. Like you sure. said, it's nonpartisan. But I think I, I refer to myself as the first out one because I don't think there's been somebody who's out before. And I mean, these firsts, that's why I'm like, they do matter. They absolutely matter. And I know that what I've learned is is by talking about this kind of stuff is representation and why it matters for the next person. Like you're saying, Damien, that, that you knew looking at this, that it's that that it's happened before. So it's not like it's an obstacle that can't, I can't wait for the time when it's not significant. You know what I mean? When it's not something that matters. And I mean, it is a big deal. It's a big deal to me to see both of you on the council because of these, these reasons, but also because of the qualifications, you know, but it's something that's hard as a host to talk about sometimes because you're like, I don't want this to think this is how I define you, but it's, it's definitely sometimes what gets your foot in the door. Cause you're like, well, let me get an idea. This is somewhat of an experience that I, has been well documented, you know, everybody's experience has been discussed, you know, like a, a general experience. And so at least we have some kind of idea of some of the things that you've dealt with. I mean, like, I'm very vocal about the fact that my mom was a lesbian. And growing up watching her, she was a state worker. She worked for Senior and Disabled Services. And she lived in Salem. And as a state worker, you know, I didn't know what nonpartisan meant. I didn't know what a Republican or a Democrat was when I was a kid. And I wish it was still that way. But but uh, <laughs> but uh, she is a state worker. And what I found is, is that she would be I wouldn't say conservative because she's definitely more liberal leaning, but she was uh, modest in the way that she approached things, because when you work for the state, you're going to represent whoever the leader is. You know, you're going to represent the whole community regardless. And so she it wasn't somebody that was going to be at a gay pride rally. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of that. I think people just think that it's it's one it's monolithic and that's just not it couldn't be farther from the truth. You know, I was so much more adamant about uh, marriage equality than she was. She's like, I just want to be left alone. I just want to be looked at as a grandma, you know, <laughs> and, and she, you know, she was raised Catholic. So she had this interesting battle where she was kind of like, I don't know if it should be that way. And I'm like, what do you mean it shouldn't be that way? Why should you not have rights? And she didn't care as much as I did about it. So fortunately, I'm still alive. So I get to push for that, for marriage equality, where she can just deal with whatever she's doing in heaven. But <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, let's talk about the direction of Springfield. You know, Damien, we'll start with you. Let's talk about the direction Springfield's heading. Now, you are a little bit of an outsider, you know, coming here from Tennessee. And so your perspective on this is really interesting because uh, how long have you been in Springfield now, actually? Um, it's been, it was five years in December. And so you've been able to see a different thing because you've seen it when Springfield, um, in my opinion, has been going through a positive progression you know, and compared to what it once was known for back in the day, we talked about this when you were on the show about a lot of drug use, a lot of the downtown situation was a mess. It was run down. It's been, it's been cleaned up and it's really nice. And there's just a sense of pride in our community. And so what do you, what do you see is the direction that Springfield's heading and what are you the most excited for? And then we'll talk about some concerns. Um, I mean, I, there have been a lot of uh, of developments that are on the table or that are going to happen. You know, uh, well, Lamar Lane, you know, will be able to do some things. And, and I'm excited to see what, you know, are they going to listen to people to make these developments for the city uh, or for the people, I should say, because, you know, oftentimes when, when you try to modernize, you become something different, you know, and I, and it, it's so funny how people in Springfield love to distance themselves from Eugene. Uh, but I see a lot of overlap and, and, and one thing, yeah, I'm just, I'm really excited to see what these new developments will be, but then also, you know, I'm not, I'm a person who, who, who I think big, but operates small. And so, you know, when I came on, it's like, I want to see barbecue grills in the parks. And, you know, there's a possibility that could happen. And it might not be something that will be seen like on the council level or state level, but you're going to have a change in culture. Uh, you know, 
I I think a lot of people just assume that I'm anti-cop. I mean, I'm anti-cops who do dumb stuff. But I think uh, Chief Shear has done a lot of really good things. He's been a lot tr- more transparent. And 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 there's gonna, it's going to take a long time, a long time to heal. Uh, and and some people might not, not ever heal. And so I'm just really excited to see what what that's going to do for the city. You know, um, I yeah, I mean, I think those are the the the, the biggest things. You know. I really need the city to bring a Popeyes to Springfield. I love how it's, uh, always, it's always food. Yeah, but that's other relatable. Than that, I mean, I, I, th- I think you know that's what's ex- what excites me the most. So I want to follow up on that, and then mm-hmm. before we go to Corey, uh, with you know with Chief Shearer, uh, when I did the interview with him, I got a lot of backlash from from people that that uh, basically were trying to tell me like, oh, that was all performative. And I'm thinking, well, if they're performing for us or for me, isn't that a step? I mean, w- is that something that you relate with where you're like, if they're telling me what they think I want to hear, at least they're actually considering what I want to hear. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, is that a step in the right direction? Uh, I, mean, I, I would say so, you know, uh, because when you do things like this, you make yourself vulnerable. And you, you know, I think certain positions you're put up here, but when you're doing things like this, you got to come here, you got to be at eye level. And so it opens you up to criticism, to being vulnerable, but it also opens you up to listen and learn. And so I, I think that, I think that's a step in the right direction. I mean, nothing, you, you know, if we had a magic wand to make everything great overnight, then, you know, none of us would be needed, but how I define great is going to be different from everybody else. And so yeah, I mean, we'll yeah, just that's see what I mean, that's the thing that I just I thought about that. It's like when people say, "Ah, uh, you know, that's performative." I'm like, well, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's something, you know. And 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 we always tend to doom and gloom, but sometimes we forget to focus on the po- the progress, you know. So, Corey, let's hear, uh, you know, your your vision of the direction that Springfield's heading. What you're the most excited for, and maybe throw in some some concerns too. Uh. So- Thank you for that. And I, I, it's always interesting hearing Damien's because he's bringing a different perspective, again, a different perspective. And the focus on culture is something I really appreciate because I tend to be, can be really cerebral and I'm like, I want housing and I want infrastructure and I want these things. And so it's helpful to think, oh, how you experience the city involves the culture of the city and people wanting to come and live here and stay here is really tied to the culture. And that's, I think, what a lot of the passionate things that happen when people come about council, they may be talking about bike paths, but they're really talking about like their vision of their cultural experience in the city. Um, And I appreciate that because I don't, I don't always, I don't always go there because I'm looking at things a little bit differently. Um, So what some of the things I'm still really excited about with Springfield is like you, Patrick. I mean, I think that I I'm always looking at things in terms of how are people interacting with it. So people may there may be this mythology of like Springfield as this unique entity, but we we all don't experience it that way. We we live and work in Springfield, Eugene, Junction City, the area like we're experiencing it, and, and you know we may go to a dentist over here and we may you know put our kids in a school over here and so I tend to like that's how I overlay my thinking about it and so I still think that spring there's a unique spot for Springfield and some of the things that I get the most exciting about are things that people might think are boring like I love that we have leaned into um, housing and the codes and things like that more creatively and we've been willing to try things and willing to say we're going to just you know support housing at all of these different levels and we're going to work with these partners and we're going to try this stuff that I love about Springfield because I'm like in a lot of ways it's more affordable to live in Springfield and that's also part of what's like changing the conversation as people you know younger folks and by younger I mean younger than me and I'm 55 on Monday it's like have are moving in and having families or people are retiring here because it's affordable and they're wanting something different from the city than what it used to be and that's helping to like push that or developers are coming in and saying this is a great opportunity because it areas have been underdeveloped. So I get excited about that because I think, oh man, in 20 years, it could look a lot different. And like you said, it's our job 
to s- decide what that is and make sure it doesn't look like someplace else. Like yeah. how do we keep our unique sort of feels around that? So I get, I get excited. I feel like we're in transition and I love movement and transition and like moving my furniture around. So I get really excited about that. The one thing that I see as a big, I mean, Eugene and Springfield is it's one County. So it is one thing, it, but there is stark differences in the, in the way that I'm, the, what I've learned about city government. And one thing that I said, and I'm going to get a lot of you know flack for this, but this is just my observation. I feel like there's there's a difference between advocates and activists. You know, there's advocates that are like going to going to go to bat for you. Activists want attention, and this is something I've learned. Someone told me this recently, and I wish I could remember who it was because it's great. You know, but I really, from what I've seen in city government, why Springfield's doing a good job is I don't think that there's activists there's advocates there's people that are trying to do some some work and they're not it's not about getting attention i know damien i know you don't care about the attention you're like i'm just doing my job you know you know and and i'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus or but sometimes when you have such a dominant political viewpoint in eugene whatever it is you know and and the college and all that stuff because there's there's conversations on a college campus that aren't even real you know that are just out there and there's some that are very real, you know, and, and, and you have to navigate that however you do. But I, I feel like in Springfield for working folk, that's something that they don't relate to when they think about the campus life or the, the far kind of extremism one way or the other. And yes, we've got our section in Thurston where there's some chuckleheads, but, but at the same time, there's some great people too that just want to work and just want to, they're like, leave me alone. I believe in freedom. I believe in your, in your own, in your own way of life and just leave me alone and don't come at me and ask me about all these other stuff. You know, I just want to do my, I just want to do my job, keep my nose clean, keep, keep, you know, feeding my family, putting food on the, on the family. Isn't that what Bush said? I got to put food on my family. (laughs) But, but, uh, so yeah, I mean, I know that that's, it's not fair to compare Eugene and Springfield. I just don't think it's fair because of sheer size. You know, when Springfield is like river road, basically, (laughs) it's like one section that no one even really knows much about. You know, because if you go to River Road, you're probably not coming back. No, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So, have you ever spent time in North Eugene? And no one ever talks about that place. No. <laughs> Anyways, I don't have a ton of time. And so, there's a couple things I want to talk about. And this is this is so long-winded, so we'll see if we can keep it short. But being that this is a nonpartisan seat, how can we as a society bridge the the divide? You know, I mean, being in a nonpartisan seat, you're supposed to think for the bigger picture. I think you should always do that in elected office and not be a party person. I want to start with you, Damien, because I know that you don't really consider yourself to be somebody that falls inside the parties. How can we bridge, you know, how can society bridge the divide, especially caused by misinformation? Um, no, thanks. Good question. I, honestly, I think the biggest misstep that we have is that I think people look to be divisive. Uh, people have a tendency to react without reflection. And, you know, and I've said this before, like if I do that, I'm going to get killed. Uh, And there's a lot of privilege in being able to react without reflection. You know, I think whenever, I think in the army taught me to react and reflect at the exact same time, you know, but that's not a skill that a lot of people have. And I think that people are just looking to be so divided and they're looking to elevate everything to a political issue versus, you know, a lot, I know, I know a lot of them weren't raised like that, you know, and so they have a tendency to forget, you know, that, that they drink the, the Kool-Aid of, of the, 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 the two party system and they, they don't know how to remove themselves from that. Uh, people really get in their feelings. I mean, I pissed a whole lot of people off just by me telling my truth. And it's like, how are you mad at me? Because I told you how my life is. But yet you also scream diversity. Uh, And and it's kind of ridiculous, honestly. You know, I I think when I first, uh, you know, took off with two months in, you know, I had spoken with Chris Wigg a little bit. And, you know, I went to the Democratic page and I was like, no black people in here except one. But whatever, you know, uh, I have a lot of respect for Chris Wigg. And and, and regardless of him being over the Democratic Party, it seems that he actually cares about getting stuff done. Uh, and, and no disrespect to any Republicans, but that website, holy crap. Right. You know, and I, and I, cause I was thinking like, who can I reach out to, to where we can figure out a way just to talk? 
And when I saw the conspiracy, I was just like, yeah, I, I probably need to delete my browser history. <laughs> yeah, get the, uh, get so the yeah, algorithm. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think that I think that's one of the, the, the biggest things. People want to be divisive. People want to have a social agenda. People no longer want to sit. Well, I mean, it's kind of hard, but, you know, sit down, break bread and just talk. People are looking to be offended uh, and people just don't see how. I'll give you an example. So a lot of research that is presented to the council to make things happen are based on larger cities. And these larger cities have more resources. Uh, I made a joke in the, in the last city council meeting we had because there was something about New York. I was like, guess what New York has? More than three black people. Uh, and so you're using all this research to say this is the way Springfield needs to go. But it's like, this is that's not Springfield ain't New York. Right. And so the same issues that you complain about or that you have issues with, you're using research of a city that has completely different issues. And you're trying to take that and put it here. It could be its start because I've done it before. I talk about Memphis and things, but this ain't Memphis and I'm not trying to make it Memphis. Uh, but people are so busy using book knowledge and being, you know, following either something they saw on Facebook or party lines to actually think for themselves. Right. Uh, and I, I just, I, I, I don't get it. it. It's really a problem. I think that humility is something that we all need to learn, <laughs> you know, like to, to, for me, I just try to be like self-aware, you know, and, and admit that I'm sometimes out of line and that I get emotional and get, get caught in my feelings. Like you said. And I'm willing to admit that. I just I think that we would all be better off if people would just be like, you know what, I was out of line or I was I was just looking at this differently. But I think it's so important what you said about why are you going to get mad at me for me just telling you how I feel? You know, you know what I'm saying? Or for the way I look at it. And that's it's people are defensive for many reasons. And we could be here forever. We should have a whole episode about that. I did, You know, Corey, I, I got about five minutes. Let's hear, you know, what you have to say for you. I'm going to ask it a little different, you know, how, well, the same question, how can we bridge, how can we as a society bridge the divide really caused by misinformation? But you had talked about, you know, your sexuality and orientation. It's like, has that have came into play when you're talking to somebody maybe that's a little bit more conservative or are they able to see you for the same thing? Cause I think once people realize it's like, I love my partner, I love my wife. It's not different. It's not different. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Then, then people are starting to kind of get over that. So how, you, you know, you can answer that how you want, but that's not really a question. But <laughs> so. well, and what I love about city government, right, is that we're talking about city things. Yeah. So, and I've joked uh, at council meetings, and I'll probably say it forever. Like I, I find myself agreeing with Councilor Pishnery more often than I am excited to say. Sure. But it's because we're talking about, you know, we're talking about property. We're talking about, um, you know, infrastructure. We're talking about these things, um, and and we're focusing on that. And so those things to me are not necessarily fraught with like morality and values and those things that tend to like get really emotional and people get divisive about. We might have really different opinions about what the process should be in terms of annexing this area into Thurston or whatever. We might have very different feelings about that. Or we all have sort of different ideas of how Main Street should be developed in order to make it safer and so the fact that we're focusing on that it's like it doesn't matter i mean it just it doesn't matter <laughs> in terms yeah, of yeah. my sexuality or that doesn't my age or any of those things don't matter it but my opinions and my experience and and whether or not i'm listening to the constituents and how much i'm weighing that that's the part that matters and so um i think i said when i was running that you know one of the things i think that i bring is just years of working in those kind of environments where it's like you're trying to find where's the what's the conversation like what's the conversation we can all have and are we even talking about the same thing and it doesn't the, the sort of personal identity politics don't play into that what they do do though is bring this like diversity of perspective and especially if you've dug into like what you know like Damien and I talk about you know we all have to own our privilege right we have to own what we are and so I can say oh I, I'm this but I'm also this and this and this right I'm also a property owner but I'm somebody who grew up in a really working class you know 
wood products based family. And so I can like bring all of those perspectives in and own the privilege or the space that I'm able to take up with that while acknowledging not. And so that's why sometimes I find myself agreeing with things. So I, I really love the fact that we're talking about city services. And yeah. I think that's the, what brings all the counselors together. It's like Councillor Mo and I sit and talking about you know, the D street and how fast the traffic is, it doesn't matter that there's like, you know, however many decades of differences in our age or he's from Springfield and I grew up somewhere else. It doesn't matter because we're focused on that. Right. Yeah. And I mean, again, they're nonpartisan seats. And so it's really, really important that, that it stays that, I mean, that's the way that it's been built. That's the way that it's been designed. And, you know, there's so much crossover. There's reasons. I mean, a guy like Joe Bernie, who's running for County commissioner, he is fighting for workers' rights. We might people may disagree on the strategy and how much the government's role is in cer- certain things, but there's a lot of working class people that may me be, be more conservative that would look at his platform and be like, "I'm actually really interested in this," you know. And so sometimes you got to think about you know, like a guy like Anthony Reed was running for school board. He 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 wasn't he didn't win, but he's not done. He was talking about you know. Uh, basically trade schools teaching trade schools and stuff and and pushing that and i think that that's somebody more conservative that might perk their ears up a little bit and i think that people need to stop thinking about it sometimes in like the issues when we're talking about city government just like you're saying when we're like what's your stance on abortion it's like what does this matter this is this is not going to be done in my office do you know what i'm saying these conversations (laughs) now they might they could come up you know in certain issues but a lot of times we're talking about like budget allocation and parks and things like that. It's not going to be these major things. And so people can find common ground. And that's cool to hear what you have to say. I wish we had more time. Zoom, you get like 40 minutes when you have multiple people on. So I didn't pay for the premium. I probably shouldn't say that on the podcast because it's so unprofessional. But Or you, sh- or you could and somebody might say, I'm going to sponsor so that we can yeah. hear more of these what fabulous a... conversationalists. What? What a segue. If you want to sponsor the show, you can go to... Uh, sdrpod.com slash sponsors shout out to my title sponsor oregon cash flow pro for james barber for constantly believing in me since the beginning he's been with me since the beginning i've had sponsorship offers that were bigger that i declined because i'm like nah this guy believes in me i until he cancels it i'm gonna keep it going so you know damian pitts Corey rodley thank you so much uh, it's really a treat to get to know you better. I am honored by creating this show out of thin air that I be, have became friends with, with both of you, with Sean Van Gordon, Mayor Sean Van Gordon. Joe Bernie and I just did an interview, and I, I felt like I knew him after two minutes of talking to him. This is something that would intimidate the heck out of me, the whole concept, even three years ago, and I'd already been a year deep into the podcast, but now I've been able to kind of somehow – make something out of this and create valuable friendships. And I'm lucky because I don't have to be all buttoned up. I can be me and people will, will accept that. And that's been, it's been really, really meaningful. So, and, and to the audience, thank you so much for continuing to listen. I got some big ones coming up. I'm interviewing Andrew Kalich, Kalich. We'll find out. I think it's Kalich and Doyle Canning. Those are two candidates uh, for Congress. That's incredible for me, for me. I'm excited. I'm also going to have Chris Wig on. We had mentioned Chris Wig. Chris Wig's going to come on and talk about, you know, why this is so, to be partisan for a second here, why it's so crucial, you know, for the local community that the Democrats maintain power over Congress, because I think that we're going to get a massacre in the, in the general, uh, in the nation, as far as, is, is the house. So it'll be interesting to see what the coming years have, uh, election. Your seat is up, Damien. I do want to talk about this quickly. You haven't decided yet if you're gonna if you're gonna continue yet. Yeah, I mean to be honest, I mean like the fact, like rumor has it there's a list at University of Oregon that has all the black people that have left. And honestly, I can tell you what conversations that I've had with a lot of my colleagues that have been here in the last year or two, they won't be here in, in two years, and I need them. They're my support. Sure. Um, so it's it's hard. It, honestly, it's really hard for me to see myself here in four more years for four more years. You know, once my term is up, it'll be six years that I've been here. You know, thinking about this from a career perspective. I mean, I'm single, no kids, so I can pretty much do what I want to. And it's not in my blood to stay in one place for long times. Uh, but hey, you never know. Yeah, I do want to say, even if it ends up being two years that you serve. Thank you for your service to our community. I think it's been really valuable. And I think what you bring to the table is appreciated, you know? So 
I, you know, I do want to say that. And, and Corey to you as well. I mean, I think, you know, hopefully you're in it for the long haul. I think that you're, like you said, you're a homeowner in Springfield. So, uh, you can't sell your house cause then you have to buy another one and they're not any cheap. So, I mean, we're, <laughs> you know, we just, we just dropped three grand on a stupid sliding glass door. So, I mean, I'm in the same well, boat. I'm not right going now, nowhere. If we, did, if we did sell our house, then I would have to move to another one in the ward. So that's the other oh, thing. Yeah. Like it'd have yeah. to be in the ward. Oh, that's true. So, so I'd have to be like, it's either Mark, Mark Hola Meadows or I stay put. For people while, have asked so. me because I live in, 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 in the Thurston area and people are like, are you going to run? I'm like, what? Like, do you know my skeletons? Oh my God. But maybe one day I think about it. Like, I think that for me, because of juggling the, the, the work thing, I think for me, that's going to be my retirement goal is that that's when I would run for city council. I've got a lot to learn. So that gives me 20 25 to 70 years before I can retire. Cause I don't know if I can do it in 25. So if I, if I'm 60 years old, that's when I would do it. And I, I used to think all these old folks, they shouldn't be on, not you, you're 50. That's not old, <laughs> you know, 50. No, but like the, I think these old folks that I used to think, Oh, maybe we need, you know, young blood. We do, but I see why though on these, on these seats, why the people that are retired, are the ones that are, are fit to serve because they've had their work experience for one. And then they've also got the time. It takes so much of your time. So I used to think like that. I used to be like, why is it always these people? And I understand now it's either that your, your spouse is wealthy and can, can take care of you or, you know, or you're retired and you have the time or you're getting your pockets padded. No, I'm just kidding. No, one, people, <laughs> people think that I've read some stuff. They're like, these guys are getting paid off by the, cannabis companies and i'm like i bet you that they would love it if it was the case it's not it's not even close to true not even close so hey thank you both so much damian pitts Corey rodley springfield city council uh i'm gonna end this with a song i chose one of mine just because it's uh an homage to the northwest so this is a song by me patty rose featuring rio this is come back to the northwest carry me to a place where no worries can be found Struggles are non-existent, we can simply enjoy the sound of a unified collective with a focus on humanity. Our soul's only objective is lose and maintain sanity. Come back to the Northwest, cause I haven't left yet. Come back to the Northwest, cause I haven't left yet. Eugene, I love you and I'll place no place above you. I escape the hate that some people have it with it from too many people don't see how great this city is the music that we make may never make it to the biz but the kids they love to hear it so they memorize the lyrics inspires and it drives them appreciated spirit that's the sound of change music that comes from the brain use it to work through the pain this music's why we used to reign Where no worries can be found Struggles are non-existent We can simply enjoy the sound Of a unified collective With a focus on humanity Our soul's only objective Is lose and maintain sanity Come back to the Northwest Cause I haven't left yet Come back to the Northwest Cause I haven't left yet Poverty or patience Reluctance to join Anything representing the commercialistic coin We struggle for our freedoms like bicycling naked Any chance for a positive reload We take it not Guns, hugs, more nugs and smoke Probably why I'm always broke Without ammunition, thus condition can turn on itself A steam boat wheelie In a tree with a chain and sympathy Stay until we all feel empathy I fight the earth and its inhibitors And I still respect